Hey this is Sayyam Botani and you're listening to Chai Time Data Science a podcast for data science enthusiasts where i interview practitioners researchers and calculators about their journey experience and talk all things about data science Hello and welcome to another episode of the Chai Time Data Science Show. I have to say I'm really honored to be interviewing Dr. Mark Langto in this episode, who's a research scientist at DeepMind and also one of the contributors of AlphaGo. Mark has done a PhD in computer science with a focus on sampling algorithms for equilibrium computation and decision making in games, and his current research interests include general multi-agent learning and planning. computational game theory reinforcement learning and game research in this interview we talk about deep learning research and alphago research at deep mind as well as about the open spiel project which is a framework for reinforcement reinforcement learning in games we also talk about all about swift for tensorflow and the promise it holds i'm really grateful to mark who is kind enough to do this interview and share many great advices as well i hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as i did and if you'd like to know more about swift for tensorflow there's another episode that has been released about swift for tensorflow so do check that out if, if you're interested for now here's the interview please enjoy the show Hi everyone it's an absolute honor for me to have Dr Mang Mark Langto on the show Dr Mang Langto is a research scientist at one of the world's best if not the best research institute deep mind and uh, thank you so much Dr Mark for joining me on the interview series Yeah no problem thanks for having me I'm super happy to do this It's an absolute honor to have you So uh, you currently a research scientist at deep mind and uh, you've picked a if I may traditional uh, path in the research uh, community could you tell us what got you interested in broadly speaking machine learning and ai and what made you pick up this as a career path for yourself yeah i i simply games i'm a very games focused person um i've always really been interested in, in games from the start um like uh, at an early age Uh, I was interested in games in the Commodore 64. Uh, played a lot of games, and naturally, I was curious about, um, you know, how do you implement these games. So I became interested in programming um, from an early age, and I played a lot of games, starting, of course, with video games. But then, uh, as I got older, like uh, looking into other kinds of forms of games, so like, uh, you know, role-playing games and uh, you know, collectible card games and board games and all kinds of uh, of games. Yeah. Um, I think one of the uh, main things that got me interested in in artificial intelligence in general is, you know, playing against these computer programs when I was younger and wondering how are they making those decisions, right? So like mm-hmm. a chess, uh, you know, playing against a chess uh, computer chess program, um yeah. how what's going on in the background there? Uh how is it possibly deciding to move this pawn here and there? <laughs> um yeah, and just getting really curious about that from like a really young age, you know, before I learned anything about Uh, computers officially I was already starting to think about that um and I think uh you know working with these playing with these uh computers and seeing what they could do uh I thought to myself wow if they can do something as you know as amazing as beat me at chess <laughs> and uh this is you know there's uh, this is quite amazing so I just naturally got interested in that way what what was your favorite game maybe for, for today and of all time favorite game of all time I would say uh there's there's really three that kind of tie it for me in a category. Okay. So uh Magic the Gathering I think was probably the one that I uh played the most. Okay. Um I think if I had to choose one I would choose that one mainly because it was the one that I really spent the most time playing and I really it's kind of at the intersection of board games 
uh, and you know fantasy uh, style role playing games, which I played a lot of. So Dungeons and Dragons is my other one. Okay, uh, it's one of the other top three, and I think if I had to choose a board game, I think Diplomacy is a really nice one. Got it. Um, I'd also love to know. So you eventually ended up in the research path. Uh, what made you pick research over uh, industry, as we call it? Um, I think so. I, I think I was naturally just um, uh, interested in the question of why. Um, so uh, I, I I just needed to know the answers. <laughs> okay. Uh, it, it was. Uh, I think that's what really drove me towards uh, towards research. I didn't I didn't actually think I was going to end up in research when I was younger. Um, I think I was going to do something more uh, related to like uh, developing games because I was so, you know, interested in games. Um, And I think what happened was through um, just having to know the answer to why, you know, I was the, when I was young, I really, I was one of these kids who asked why, why, why all the time. (laughs) And I was never satisfied. (laughs) So so this is a continuation of that. (laughs) I think researchers Um, also ask these questions. So it's, it's definitely a continuation. Yeah. And, and it's just, I naturally gravitated when, I mean, when I found out that I could uh, mix my interest with games uh, and uh, artificial intelligence, and the pursuit, you know, of knowledge and, and you know, artificial general intelligence more broadly, I thought, wow, that's something I, I, I would really like to do. Did you also end up programming any game or uh, did you want to do that just out of curiosity? Oh, I mean, I've programmed a lot of games. I, I, I haven't programmed any game that got uh, shipped. Okay. Um, so I, I, but I've done a lot of games myself. So before, I mean, in high school, before anybody was learning uh, anything about programming, I was actually developing games just on my own because that's what I was, well, okay. I was interested in. Um, and so, you know, how to develop a chess program and how to develop, uh, you know, a program where you can walk through rooms and open doors and these kind of things and pick up keys. And, you know, that's the kind of thing I was always. I was and always interested this was the pre ray tracing, pre very cool graphics era, right? Yeah, very much the pre very uh, very cool graphics era because uh, I actually you know one of my favorite games is uh, was released on the Intellivision. Um, it was called uh, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons: Treasure of Tarman, and okay. this is actually a three D perspective game uh, that was released very early um, uh, before uh, before yeah before Nintendo. Okay, um, before and, I was born. Uh, born. <laughs> Sorry, that that would be before I was born. Then. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, it's very early. So. I, you know, when uh, when the research was coming out on deep reinforcement learning and it used uh, Atari um, as uh, as the games, uh, uh, as the platform uh, yeah. for which it was learning games and, and, and it, its uh, policies in, um, I, that really, uh, that, that uh, I could relate to that in a way uh, because I played a lot of those same games. So a lot of the Commodore 64 games and early platformer games um, are still like Montezuma's Revenge, for example. So when I watch an AI playing Montezuma's Revenge, I could say, wow, I played that game. I know how to play it and I can completely relate to what it's learning because I learned that when I was younger. Right. Um, so, so yeah, it was, it was really those early games that got me started. And I think like the, the whole story with deep reinforcement learning starting through like, uh, you know, uh, general game playing on Atari, I think it's just incredible. Got it. That's that's an amazing story. Coming to what you're doing currently, you're at DeepMind, which I'm sure all of the listeners are familiar with. Could you tell us what does a day in the life of a research scientist at DeepMind look like? How is it different? Maybe are your water cooler conversations, complex math, <laughs> differential equations? Yeah, <laughs> so, so some of them are. Uh, Interesting. <laughs> it's... Um, no, it's so well. It's a it's an amazingly comfortable environment. Uh, so we get to do uh, like a lot of it. I feel like it's just a continuation of my PhD, but like just surrounded by um, you know an uh, amazing uh, group of people that I get to have conversations with on an, on an everyday basis. So I I, I work a, I collaborate a lot with uh, with London and, and Paris. So I'm in I'm in uh, DeepMind Alberta, which is in Edmonton. Okay. So it's a seven hour time difference uh, between uh, London and Paris. So I have a kind of an interesting workflow, which is, you know, I work up, I wake up in the morning and I'm already starting to think of, you know, can I contact people who are, you know, during their, uh, in their work hour day okay. uh, so that I can get like, uh, you know, an answer back from them. Um, 
you know, before I get to work and then I can start thinking about problems. But I mean, the, the environment uh, is really, uh, is really amazing. So like uh, a lunchtime conversation, you asked about water, cool, water cooler conversation. <laughs> I think really the setup, one of the really uh, nice benefits and setups about the, our work environment is, is it, it has always been modeled around, um, you know, the ideas uh, come from the really a bunch of putting a bunch of passionate people uh, into a lunchroom, having lunch, uh, and talking about ideas and really a lot of our ideas have come that way um, they're not always uh, they're not always intricate or complicated right or, or complex like the first time they come around um, you know some of the ideas are really you know half formed you know uh, oh I have this idea uh, this like uh, why you know uh, I read in this paper that uh, you know, it takes like certain approach uh, why can't we do it this way right and then you know three or four people respond to that um, and a lot of ideas are born from the fact that, you know, that conversation, that conversation itself has shed light on the idea that that person had, and then they go back, they take that feedback and they, that's sort of what fuels their passion towards working on that. Got it. So, uh, what does the research pipeline for you look like? Uh, do you get these ideas during these discussions, maybe while reading a paper and how do you approach a new idea once you have a good, uh, foundation or theory in your mind? Yeah, so I, it all starts with a, like a hypothesis. And for me, it's a lot about uh, like incremental improvement. So, uh, you know, really where I want to get to is solving the large problems, the general problems. Um, you know, that's why I really um, like the, the kind of style uh, problems that we work on at DeepMind, which is about, uh, you know, generalizing. It's artificial general intelligence, or really generalizing across different domains, right? So Atari really appealed to me, and now we're doing this in 3D worlds. And... Um, and, you know, I think, uh, you know, uh, games are no exception to this. Uh, you can, you can think of developing an artificial intelligence for a, uh, for a general setting. Right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, one thing I mentioned was this in incremental improvement. Um, the way I approach research is I kind of, I'm like constantly self critical. Um, okay. so I, you know, when we, when we, uh, put out a body of work, uh, we have an idea mm -hmm. and of course we're very ambitious. And we want to, you know, uh, solve everything all at once. <laughs> uh, but, you know, then we think about it and we like, we realize, you know, that's not going to be as easy as it sounds, right? Or as I'd like it to be. Um, so we go to, you know, we go to try, th we just, we, we try small versions of it just to test some of the hypotheses, right? right. Um, at the end of the day, once we've done enough sort of iterations on it, at the end of the day, we believe we have like a solid piece of, uh, you know, research work that we can go and put forward. So but, essentially a baseline uh, for, for your project or idea? Yeah, like a little, I mean, this is the way I do it. Um, okay. we, uh, I have a concept, uh, I have an idea, mm -hmm. and the idea sounds hard, right? Okay. So, and I can't answer the question of will this work, right? Or right. will this work at scale? Um, what I can answer are smaller questions like, um, if I develop a small enough uh, environment that I can just quickly test on, um, just to test a few, like, you know, if this big hypothesis has any merit, then at the very least, it should uh, satisfy condition, you know, X, Y, and Z. Um, and I can test those out in a small environment, and then I can, I can get a green light for myself, right, and decide, right. okay, it's acting the way I expect. That means there's some potential here. Um, now let's just go, f you know, let's go forward with this and push it try and push it up Got and it. and eventually that process kind of leads to not just collaborations but like a bigger um you end up tackling bigger problems by sort of caref carefully identifying uh your own hypotheses um along the way and your own and, and and learning constraints right so things you didn't think about will come into play uh and you know the results will will fall out that's oh you know that's not quite what i expected <laughs> oh, I, have to re I have to think about this and i think I guess I'm trying to give this example as a nice um, depiction of what my entire research career looks like, because uh, one, you know, what we do is, so we take something that we're happy with, we bundle it up and we, I don't know, present it somewhere, write a paper about it, something. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it, it, you know, you have to have made some form of like restrictions or environment, uh, you know, uh, constraints Please. so that you can make progress. Um, and, for me, what drives me is undoing those constraints over time. 
So, Got it. you know, if we've, if I've made a bunch of constraints to say, look, we have to get somewhere, we have to show, you know, uh, we, we, you know, we can't just solve it all at once <laughs> in a day. Step by step, um, generalizing. Exactly. It's very, very incremental. Um, and so when I say I'm self-critical, I look back at my own um, things that I've written, things that I've presented internally, um, and I say, okay, um, you know, this was nice, but there's this asterisk that I kind of want to get rid of, right? Um, you know, it made these kind of assumptions and I want to undo those Go slowly over time. And the whole reason for that is that over time, um, we're just making our algorithms better and better. We're dropping our assumptions. We're making everything more general. Um, and, you know, that was the story with, uh, with you know, my involvement with AlphaGo and then <laughs> AlphaGo Zero and Alpha Zero, right? It was, it was really like that, you know, AlphaGo started... Right. Uh, and then, you know, we, we, look, we looked at one game, right? Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we used uh, a database of, of, of moves to, yeah. to, you know, start the supervised learning, uh, start the policy from supervised learning. And then it was like, oh, that wasn't, you know, we questioned ourselves, right? Like, was, can we get rid of those expert demonstrations? Removing um, the Aztec and, step by step again. Exactly, right? And it turns out like, yes. And it's like, wow, that's amazing. Okay. <laughs> Can we do other games? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so you know, challenging ourselves just like incrementally over time, and and just striving to um, get more and more general. Um, On a funny note, I have a request. Please don't uh, become superhuman at Counter Strike. That's one game that I really enjoy playing. <laughs> And I'd be, I really hate to be beaten completely by a computer program. There, so. <laughs> it's yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of what um, I think. Yeah. It's a really interesting dynamic, right? When you're, when you're first beaten by an AI, Yeah. because uh, you know, you have mixed feelings about this, right? So like I gave the example of chess um, when you play a chess game uh, and you get beaten by a chess AI, and you realize I'm not as smart as this thing, right? And then later on in life, I found out what Minimax was and what heuristic search was. Yeah. And I realized, and there was something just unsatisfying about, you know, how uh, the computer beat me, right? Because it just was like somebody else. Who, exactly. It was somebody else who put heuristic knowledge into this program with, with a good search algorithm. And I thought, oh, that's, I don't, I, I was really amazed by the fact that a computer beat me at chess, but it didn't learn to beat me at chess. Yes. Um, you know, I a search algorithm and thought about a lot more possibilities than I can keep in my head. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, it beat me in chess. Right. And yes. I think that's really where uh, I got started, which is, you know, I, I want to, uh, I want a learning algorithm to learn from scratch how to beat me in chess. <laughs> it was not enough for it to beat me at chess with minimax and heuristics. <laughs> what, what's your take on maybe like uh, the motivational or the emotional aspect of getting beaten by a computer program? So you also worked at uh, Ubisoft, uh, which is a major, major uh, gaming studio for those who aren't familiar. Or if you could give us some inside information, maybe Demis uh, played with uh, the chess program and if he was beaten what was his reaction with it so I, so amazingly i've never actually seen demis play the uh the, the program but i would say it's very unlikely that he didn't play it um <laughs> i the funny part with with me and my interaction with uh the alpha go project was i am not a go player okay. and it was a new experience for me um to work on artificial intelligence on a game that I was not familiar with. Right. Um, so, and, and, you know, I did the best that I could to try and learn to play go, but even then uh, it was making moves that were far beyond my uh, level of mm -hmm. comprehension of the game. Um, so, you know, I, I could never play it um, okay. because there was no, I, I didn't understand enough about uh, the conventions of the game, about how the play styles, um, and yeah, so I found that uh, dynamic uh, kind of interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's also one of the challenges that DeepMind took up because uh, Go is one of these beautiful, wonderful games that has so many complexities. So that also speaks to... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like um, I could relate to, um, you know, when, uh, when we were watching the, uh, the games, uh, um, you know, I could relate to people's surprise and reaction 
um, towards, uh, you know, how that, you know, the, the moves that were being made. Uh, because, th you know, that's how I would debug my, you say, implementations of Monte Carlo tree search, right? I yeah. would play it on a game and I would put it in situations where, okay, well, clearly it has to do this. Otherwise there's a bug. Mm -hmm. um, and like that, that, that part of it wasn't so easy for me um, when we were, when we were using Go. But uh, I, I mean, I learned uh, a lot about Go in the process. Um, and it was, yeah, I, I really wish I had been able to, uh, you know, <laughs> follow everything from the start, having, you know, been uh, more of an expert uh, in the game. But uh, I can completely relate to when people were seeing the things it was doing yeah. and being surprised by it. Um, and yeah, that, that, part, that part is game independent. Like it was just... <laughs> Uh, you know, when you're surprised and you're looking at something, you're looking at a system that you've built um, that can completely just, um, you know, uh, completely learn from scratch, a new way of playing, right? That was the, you know, that like uh, people have played these games for thousands of years. Um, nobody would predict that it would make a move, you know, number 37. Uh, and, you know, people called it this creative move. And I can, you know, I can completely see that. Um, <laughs> And I mean, that was just incredible. Uh, it, it, you know, it was creative. Yeah. So uh, would, would you think of this as a creative AI or would you, in, in hindsight, would you have anticipated this, that this, that this is totally possible? I, so I definitely would not have anticipated um, things like that, um, you know, completely new ways of playing. Because you think when, uh, you know, people have these conventions and these, uh, sort of adopted protocols, right? In certain yeah. games, like here's a, because people study these for years, right? So here's a, here's a, here's a chess book. You read it and you, if you're in this situation, this is the right move. Um, so you would think through self play, you would encounter um, like a lot of the moves that, uh, you know, traditionally have been reached through. Uh, through also, humans. the model uh, was trained on these moves. So this would have been a rare occurrence in most of the cases, I believe. Yeah, that's right. So, but then there's the self play element that happens after that. Now you just let, now that's where that's where things get really interesting, right? Because you are now your teacher. You're almost starting to you're teaching this thing through uh, human made moves. Mm -hmm. um, it's acquiring the knowledge of Go um, through supervised learning, um, and then you let. And I think that's you know self play reinforcement learning in games. Uh, and you know, you know that whole the whole story with the sorrow and backgammon when I was in my AI undergrad and learning all this that that fueled me. Like I, I thought to myself, I want to do that um, because I wanted to see this happen. Um, I wanted to see the thing learn on its own um, in a way that, like we, um, you know, maybe wouldn't have anticipated. Um, and so uh, I don't like. I wouldn't have expected. The reason I ex I would have expected it to learn a lot of the conventional moves is because it would have went into you know those positions um, right. that were well studied uh, mm -hmm. through self play. The the other thing, like after you know having th thought about it for a while, if you look at it now, we're combining um, techniques that had never been used before. So we're taking deep learning uh, yeah. as function approximators to evaluate uh, to use as an evaluation function. Mm -hmm. We're training them using self play reinforcement learning enhanced with Monte Carlo tree search, right? So that had never been done before. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you can argue that, okay, well, in retrospect, if you're combining these new methods and learning uh, how to play in a completely different way, um, maybe it can discover um, these entirely new strategies that you, you know, didn't anticipate. Now, that's not something I would have, right, that I would have thought of ahead of time. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I think it's really this idea, these two technologies that we've, we've put together that have just blown me away over the years that kind of um, like uh, are leading to this new kind of artificial intelligence that we're seeing now. Yeah. So one question that comes to my mind is uh, there's always this asterisk that should I continue exploring this idea? Because at the time, no one had uh, done this combination of techniques, even though now it sounds very familiar. We also have a Netflix movie that explains it very nicely but uh, so how do you decide if you want to stay obsessed with the idea continue exploring or maybe it's not worth it you'd like to end the experiment there how do you decide on that oh yeah that, that's um that's very dependent i think on the individual and how um how persistent and how um 
you know, how, how much they get stuck on one particular problem. So for, and this has happened to me oftentimes. So there's, there's a kind of problems that I really get stuck on. And if I have a hypothesis that I know must, must, must be true, yeah. or I have no reason to um, uh, think otherwise, um, and I'm running results and I'm not getting what I expect, I might spend, you know, days kind of just, I need to understand there's, there's, there's a gap in my understanding here and I just need mm -hmm. to push myself enough to understand what's happening. Um, and so of course there's a trade off there between how much time you spend trying to figure out what's going on and why your, your intuitions don't match. Um, also and at the end of the learning things don't work un at all until they do. So it's oh, yeah, super yeah. frustrating. Oh yeah. Exa I mean, yeah, exactly. And <laughs> I mean that I, I that, that's research and, and, you know, I can relate to a lot of these uh, times where you could spend, uh, you know, a, a more amount of time than you would like. And at the end you don't get a satisfying answer. So, but it's a real trade off. So some problems I've gone off and done, um, you know, spent a lot of time because I was really bothered by the fact that I couldn't answer the question. Um, and, you know, a lot of those times I've come out with an answer that felt satisfying. And there's sometimes I had to say, look, I, you know, I've spent a lot of time on this. I need to shelve it for now, but it's still kind of at the back of my head. Um, okay. And, you know, maybe I'll come back to it at some point through uh, another means. And that kind of sometimes happens. So, um, yeah, it's really a mix. And that depends really on the person and how uh, the kind of problems they're working on too. Like there's kinds of problems that lead to those dead ends more than others. And yeah. you have to be, you know, you have to be conscious of what you're getting yourself into. <laughs> For you, is it a parallel set of ideas that you're working on? Or uh, do you zero down on just one single zone or domain that you're working on? I zoom in and out uh, regularly at different um, rates. And okay. I, I always have, I always have a list of ideas um, mm -hmm. and, and the group, you know, whatever group project we're working on, I think that's also true. There's always sort of a list of, we would like to do all these things. Um, but, you know, at the, we have to choose what's most important and, and push on that. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dynamic between yourself and we, between the people you're working with, right? Yeah. So if there's a project um, and you want to make progress, uh, you may, you know, you have to make sure that you're working um, enough on, like you're contributing enough to that, to that project so that the project can move forward. Um, and at the same time, uh, you have to give yourself enough time to like get away from the project just for small amounts of time so that you can work on um, like things that are still, uh, you know, that could still be related to the project, but sort of side things yep. that you can sort of, um, so it's, it's uh, yeah, this is something that like a lot of different researchers do different at different levels of abstraction. And uh, I think it's a matter of, I think I've switched on how I handle this over time. Okay. Um, so now I kind of keep like a to-do list, right? And I just check it, they're very, like I check it frequently and I ask myself, am I doing enough on these so that mm -hmm. they're progressing or am I spending, you know, uh, too much time on one thing? And then you just make sure that you. But uh, once you maybe think of an idea for and failed experiment, you might even go back to it and again, give it another try. Yeah. And you have to just be careful that you don't switch context too much, right? Because there's a cost to switching yeah. uh, back and forth all the time. And you just, that also is not satisfying because you can make just incremental progress on like many projects, but then at the end of the day, you know, you're not pushing each one enough. Uh, <laughs> and so it's kind of, yeah, if there's a balance, <laughs> it takes a bit of training, right? Um, and, and I think that just, you get people to sort of figure out what that balance is, what, what's best for them over time. Yep. So. Switching uh, context now back to AlphaGo and AlphaGo Zero. So I actually tried to watch the movie again twice as a fan moment and I couldn't find you in the movie. So are you yeah. in the Netflix movie or not? I, I was in the next Netflix movie for about a half a second. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah, I teach, uh, I have, a, yeah, it's, uh, I think the camera has its, uh, the back to me, but I'm teaching uh, uh, a good friend of mine, Mark Bellmer, um, about something interesting. I remember, I think it's watch. research on a glass panel, if I remember correctly, was that you? No, it wasn't me. Uh, it was on a, it was on a whiteboard. Okay. I think the, there were several shots on it. 
I thought there might have been more than one shot, to be honest. Uh, but I don't, I don't quite remember. I think the, the one <laughs> really obvious one that where I noticed <laughs> was okay. I was teaching, I was teaching uh, a colleague on, on the whiteboard, but it was really just a, a snippet shot. So okay. I'm not on IMDb or anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so coming, coming back to the research aspect of it, did you anticipate it to get to the superhuman level that it is at now? And uh, once you got involved in the team, uh, could you tell us what led you to it and uh, what parts of the research were you working on? Yeah, so um, when they started working on this, um, I, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't, I was still a bit of a newcomer to DeepRL myself. Okay. Um, but the, like the progress on Atari uh, really blew me away. Um, and so I ha- it was interesting for me because I had, I, I knew we had uh, a good combination of technologies, mm-hmm. um, but I-, I had also watched, you know, the, the Go and the games community actually uh, try to crack Go uh, okay. for like, you know, 10 years before that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I knew that uh, this was not going to be an easy problem. Were you um, familiar with Go before that? I kn- uh, you mentioned Well, I was before. familiar with, yes. I mean, I was not, I didn't really know how to play. I mean, I knew the very basic rules, but uh, I, I, I wasn't good. Like, I didn't actually know how to play very well. <laughs> um, but I knew, like, Go was a, was a game that, uh, you know, after... Um, uh, the chess results in the late nineties um, and deep blue from IBM was that, uh, you know, it was kind of the next game, right? Like it, yep. was, the, it was, well, you know, it was a hard game. I mean, I guess there were a few candidate next games, um, but one that was kind of embraced by the community was, uh, was go after a few years, um, mm-hmm. you know, sort of like mid two thousands. So I had been watching the games community try and crack go. Um, and, you know, Marta, Monte Carlo research was, um, you know, a, a big milestone um, in the, you know, approach and go. Um, and, you know, the, seeing all that happen and realizing how hard go is, um, <laughs> that, you know, I, I, I knew that, yeah, I can expect good things. I didn't realize how good uh, things were going to, it, it was going to get. Okay. Um, and the new thing, and the other thing was, uh, you know, the deep, the, the whole algorithm. Um, it's very easy to, like, if somebody were to pitch me that algorithm, like at the time, actually, I mean, this happened really, um, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, oh my goodness, why haven't we done this yet? Of course, this is going to work. Um, <laughs> but I really didn't know how well it was going to work. Right. Um, yeah, so, so seeing it all happen, I think was really, uh, was, was really, really amazing. Um, I was mostly involved with, I think you asked uh, how, how was I involved, yeah. um, what, what I worked on. So yeah. the first AlphaGo, um, I had, I had come into DeepMind with, uh, uh, a lot of experience, I guess, on, on Monte Carlo tree search, not necessarily uh, in Go, but in other games. Um, and so, uh, we needed kind of like a distributed version of, of, of Monte Carlo tree search. So, okay. um, I worked on the like initial, uh, prototype. Uh, distributed version of Monte Carlo Tree Search, mm-hmm. um, and I forget what that third part of your question was. Uh, it it was uh, again. Uh, sorry. Uh, so once you got involved, uh, how did you see the growth of the algorithm? And uh, oh yeah, yeah, sorry. yeah. I already mentioned that. Like the oh yeah, and that comes back to the um, the kind of iterative improvement thing, where um, I really enjoyed seeing the process. Um, go from alpha go to alpha go zero to alpha zero that just blew me away in fact like i i want to tell the story because (laughs) i I think it's something i'll never forget um i I was in a meeting with with dave silver um and i was only sort of uh after alpha go i was involved with the the multi-agent learning team um and so I came back to uh, to Alpha uh, Alpha Zero after Alpha Go Zero. So I wasn't really a part of Alpha Go Zero, but I was kind of going to the meetings and uh, you know watching all the progress, right? And I thought to myself, "Wow, they're removing the expert demonstrations. That's going to be hard." <laughs> um, and then 
like <laughs> it, it was crazy because uh, each week uh, we had a meeting where uh, Dave was pre presenting an update on the, on AlphaCo Zero and it was just getting better and better. And um, when finally I had this meeting with Dave, um, you know, when he, he told me, okay, uh, you know, he, he, they got, um, they got to uh, what they believe could be close to superhuman intelligence with no, with no features, with no expert features, no aspects knowledge. I could not actually sit down. I, I was so <laughs> excited by that, that I had to walk around the room and, and pace back and forth because it was mind blowing. Like, <laughs> it, it, I, I, that, that I'll never forget that to this day. That, that was something that really changed like how I thought about what I was going to do with the rest of my life, because you know, up to that point, I hadn't realized we were going to get this far this fast. Um, and uh, yeah, that was just a very exciting time in my, in my career. I think it's still very beautiful. So now in hindsight, we have this amazing blog post all over the internet that explain it nicely. But if you were to truly understand it, it's still mind blowing, even in 2019 with all of the research. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. It's still even hard to believe. Like, um, you know, and when we did it uh, on three different games um, using, you know, the same hyperparameters, <laughs> great. Like, <laughs> it still seems to be amazing. Just disbelief again after this. It's it's just incredible um, to 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 see how like how far we've come. I mean, and this goes back to exactly what got me into um, you know machine learning and research in general. Right, it comes back to I wanted to play against an algorithm that I can feel had learned from scratch yeah. to play the game that I was playing. And that's really like what we had achieved. Right. Like, um, so yeah, exactly. I had to sit there and say, well, what now? Like <laughs> I, we just achieved my childhood dream back to the drawing board. Like <laughs> coming yeah, so that, back. That was exciting. Coming back to that's uh, definitely amazing. Coming back to uh, when you were working on the problem, I'd, uh, I'm also curious, how did you split the work between the team? How were the experiments distributed? For example, in engineering, you have these sprint planning to decide what to work on, what not to work on. What did it look like with the size of the yeah. team? So that, that was uh, like uh, very organic. So, you know, we'd meet um, once a week, the, the whole team. Okay. Uh, maybe we'd have small meetings individually over, over the week and, you know, we'd put things on the board and we'd decide on priorities and we'd say uh, a lot of the, a lot of what we did next and how we shaped our work was based on, you know, the ideas that we had on how to like what we thought would push it forward the most. I'm sorry. Was this a distributed team or all were in the same area? Just out of curiosity. Oh, uh, the you... original, are you talking about AlphaGo in general? Uh, yeah. it, AlphaGo specifically. Uh, so it was distributed from the start, um, but mostly, so I think, uh, so Ilya Satskiver was also like involved in the first, uh, in yeah. the first meetings. He was always uh, attending. Um, so, uh, but the, the, the three people, I mean, most of the people were from DeepMind and Google, mostly DeepMind actually. So, you know, David Silver, Chris Madison, um, um, you know, Arthur Gez, uh, Gez, uh so the, the, most of the composition of the team was, was internal. So these, just uh, because the, time the, zones add slight amount of annoyance to how do you set up the meetings and collaborate? Oh yeah. I, I, yeah, that it's, it's difficult with the video conference sometimes, um, to, to work on that. Um, but I think we made it work. I mean, the, the team uh, worked really well uh, by the GVC. So when, you know, when Ilya would come and uh, like uh, join in on the meetings, um, it was, it was easy enough to discuss the, uh, like the, the, the details through GVC. And I think that worked, that worked fairly well. Um, most of the team uh, kind of grew. There was a lot of people internally who joined the team after that. So like, I, I think I, joined, I was maybe number five or six in the original AlphaGo uh, team. Mm -hmm. um, and then it kind of grew, uh, grew after that. Um, and yeah, Adjo Huang as well, right? So he was, uh, he was in turn, um, you know, he, him and, and, and Dave and Chris kind of, you know, originally uh, made like the first version of the, uh, of the Go program. Okay. Um, and, uh, and then it grew kind of after that. But, but we really, yeah, we, stand, we stood around the room looking writing out things to do 
and kind of each deciding, okay, I'm most interested in that. I'll go to go off and do that. And then a lot okay. of the, it was a lot of progress driven. Right. So it's like somebody would come report the results and say, Oh, that's great. But you know, the network's taking too long. So can we have a smaller network? And then we'd go off and try and make it small. For you, I think uh, your PhD research was also based on uh, Monte Carlo research. So how much of a challenge was this for you? Because uh, I think you uh, took up the same problem for AlphaGo as well. Sorry, I didn't hear the first part of the question. So uh, I'm sorry, uh, your PhD focus, uh, correct me if I'm oh. wrong, was also Monte Carlo right. research. So yeah, part of my PhD was Monte Carlo research. In fact, I didn't, um, I had kind of been just a... I would never say that I was like a, you know, a sort of a mainstream machine learning guy. I always kind of uh, labeled the stuff that I was doing as machine learning because it was kind of learning. Okay. Um, I worked on two separate things. One of them was Monte Carlo tree search. Um, and another one was Monte Carlo CFR. So CFR is an algorithm that is used uh, in the imperfect information games okay. uh, like poker. Um, so I had an interest in computational game theory um, and, um, and games themselves. So search and games. Mm -hmm. um, and, and computational game theory and algorithms for producing like Nash equilibrium. Um, okay. So I always felt close enough to the machine learning community that I would, you know, I would go to all the conferences. I loved machine learning from the start. Um, I would say that I gained a lot of experience after um, talking to people um, and learning things from people at DeepMind. Um, so my thesis, I wouldn't, I would go back and say, you know, there's still, I can still call that uh, machine learning, but okay. I've, you know, not the same kind of machine learning I'm doing now. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Uh, we talked about meetings. So I was lucky enough to join one meeting. Uh, it's called open design meeting by the Swift for TensorFlow team where you presented open spiel. We'll talk yep. about open spiel, but maybe to help us set the stage, could you tell us uh, what in your opinion is Swift for TensorFlow all about and what to you is promising about it? Yeah, so Swift for TensorFlow, I'm, I'm entirely new to, and I should put a dis disclaimer that um, I'm, I'm, I don't know much about uh, Swift for TensorFlow, but I can, I've been talking uh, to Brennan Saida, mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the leads of Swift for TensorFlow, who became interested in Open Spiel through a, like a mutual contact. And uh, so I can tell you a little bit about what he's told me and sort of um, like what the, yeah, what the promising parts of Swift for TensorFlow is. Um, so the idea, as I understand it, is to have one language where you can inter interact with TensorFlow. Um, and if there's any use cases where, like, so if, for example, in OpenGPL, we have a mix of uh, C++ and Python. And uh, there, are, there are times where um, that's required, right? If you need really fast search, so like Monte Carlo tree search, um, you might want to do this uh, in C++ um, rather than in Python. Um, that now requires mixing two languages. So that's uncomfortable sometimes, right? <laughs> um, and, you know, can lead to a whole set of other problems. It's um, there and, in frameworks, but I'm sure the developers had to go through some heroic efforts to just to prepare the API like that. Oh, yeah. Um, I've, I've sat in on a few of their meetings and, you know, I have to admit that mostly don't know what's going on. Like when they talk <laughs> about the compiler internals and you know, how things are optimized behind the scenes. It's like, yeah, cool. It's, uh, <laughs> that's magic. <laughs> so uh, yeah. And, and so the idea would be that the idea behind Swift for TensorFlow, as I understand it, is that uh, you want a fast language, right? Um, so you want to avoid the latency of your host language, uh, like your, sorry, your primary language. Mm -hmm. um, so that you can avoid switching back and forth between, say, a compile time language that runs really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, Swift lets you do that because you can code in Swift, uh, you know, which is fast, and you can uh, directly interface with, uh, with TensorFlow without um, paying as much of, uh, of the like, latency, for example, as Python. But yeah, I mean, I just want to clarify again, like that's my surface level understanding of it. Yep. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know all the details, but that's sort of what I've understood from the conversations I've had. Got it. Uh, I think it's also, to me, even as a computer science undergrad, uh, so I've done my undergrad in computer science, but Python is this language that 
is sort of everyone's favorite right now, even two practitioners who aren't coders. Swift might create a challenge there because even to me, I was like, oh, braces, <laughs> braces in code and everywhere. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, so again, so in OpenSpiel, for example, we have this mixture of languages again. Um, <clears throat> it, we decided to do that. We decided to de design the code that way for exactly, well, for two reasons, to be honest. Um, the use case that I mentioned earlier, where you might want to drop down to a fast language and do fast search, right? There's another piece of OpenSpiel, like another reason that we went with a C++ as a core for the, for the environments. Um, and that's because uh, what I think what we're trying to do with OpenSpiel is get, we're trying to, okay, part of my mission with OpenSpiel is to, um, to get two communities talking that don't always talk. So like uh, the computational game, like games and search community, the computational game theory community um, and, and the RL community and the machine learning community. Right. And um, what I would like to be the case is that this one package that we're open sourcing can be used by both people, uh, by sorry, by both communities. Um, and you know, that leads to the pen potential to learn from each other. Um, okay. So, uh, you know, somebody who wants a fast search algorithm that's doing heuristic search in mm -hmm. games can use OpenSpiel for that okay. um, because they don't have to touch the Python side of the code. Um, people who only want to do machine learning and reinforcement learning can entirely only use the Python side of the code. So we, it's almost like we have two versions uh, and they're mirrored, right? So we have yeah. implementations of algorithms in C++ that, you know, interact directly with the C++ API. But you can treat OpenSpiel as if uh, it doesn't have any C++ in the background at all, because you can just look at all the Python examples and just work with Python. We knew that this would be something that we needed to address ahead of time, because you know not everybody's comfortable with hopping back and forth between two languages, and we don't want that. Yeah. That's not an easy thing to do um, when you're trying to do research. And so we have these two branches, but we wanted to cater to both crowds. Hmm. And so that's we, this is sort of our compromise. Got it. Could you maybe give us a 50 foot overview of OpenSpiel and how is it the other thing that comes to mind is how is it different from open AI gym as they call it. And uh, if you yeah. could also tell us, is the Swift for TensorFlow branch ready to use uh, compared to the other one? Oh yeah, Swift for Tensor, uh, TensorFlow branch is ready to use. It's, it's smaller than the rest because it had comparatively less uh, effort uh, uh, put towards it, but it's absolutely ready to use. Okay. Um, it has a re-implementations of um, of algorithms that are in uh, the main open spiel. Um, and it was actually really easy to do because Swift for TensorFlow, uh, while well, all the Python, most of the Python implementations use TensorFlow. And so it was fairly easy to translate um, uh, some of those algorithms straight to Swift. Um, the, the overview of spiel, open spiel really, um, the way I like to talk about it is I want it to be the Atari learning environment of, of multi-agent. Um, so what, you know, what did the Atari learning environment do for us? Um, it allow it allowed us to get one interface, um, to several different types of tasks or environments or games with a consistent, uh, API or a consistent, um, observation format. Right. Um, so that, I think that's really important for AGI, right? Because we're, we're, we're interacting, you know, we, we, what do we do? We, we make, uh, we decide on things based on what we see. Right. Yep. Everything is through our eyes. We have a consistent portal to the world uh, or a consistent observation that we base our decision making on. Um, that was really important for uh, the Atari learning environment. Uh, or sorry, that was something I think it was critical that the Atari learning environment had because now you can take algorithm and with one line, you can switch the environment that it's working on. Right. Yep. Now you got, um, but you all got it in, uh, you know, a frame buffer. Um, that was consistently sized, right? <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm really interested in multi-agent RL um, and games, you know, as I've said. Um, and so, um, I, but I'm also very much interested in this uh, breadth style approach to, you know, having algorithms that are completely general. Um, mm. And so OpenSpiel was really about that, taking a simple API uh, right. for games, um, and, uh, and, and giving it and allowing algorithms to interact with that general API so that you can literally just switch one line and change games. 
right? And make uh, general assessments of your algorithms across domains. So that's what OpenGPL is really intended for. Um, now, there's, there's, so that said, uh, answering the question of, you know, how does this relate to other RL APIs? There's a few tricky things that you have to think about when you're, when you're looking at multi-agent RL and in games in particular. Um, and so, uh, for example, uh, and they, they present a, a bigger problem than you would first expect. Right. So for example, when you play a game, um, your action space um, is not consistent across states. True. So it could, you could have a subset of legal and illegal moves. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that presents a bigger problem than you would expect because if you have an algorithm that is described as assuming you can always take actions like zero to you know, number of actions minus one, and then you arrive at a state where you don't have, like only a subset of those options are possible. This actually changes the algorithm in a very subtle and, and like on paper, uh, it's a very minor change, yeah. right? <laughs> um, but if your APIs are making those assumptions, um, it's sometimes hard to take, you know, off the shelf RL algorithms and, and modify them to account for those use cases. So like mm -hmm. legal moves uh, being a subset of the actions is one, is one thing. Uh, turn-based games is another thing. So, you know, a lot of people, and, and the literature does this on multi-agent RL, starts with, you know, the assumption that agents are all acting at the, at the same time. Um, and so, you know, but it's sometimes convenient uh, to describe the algorithms on a turn-based fashion, right? A lot, of the, a lot of the algorithms I'm used to from uh, my thesis in the computational game theory uh, community is all turn-based. Yep. And so, you know, there's a few little of these kind of seemingly very small things that get in the way um, when uh, you need to apply algorithms uh, on games. And that's why we have like a custom version of DQN in the repository because it has to be a, uh, a DQN that's aware of these like uh, use cases that you encounter in games. Got it. Uh, coming to the hardware aspect of research, uh, so this question also originates from Facebook's, uh, I think it's a book about called Pluribus. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts in terms of uh, pushing research with limited hardware because RL is uh, hardware demanding for maybe small labs or uh, independent researchers who have limited hardware scale compared to DeepMind? Do you sure. think innovations are still possible and how, oh, how yeah. can one think of uh, these uh, restrictions or how should yeah, one? I think, I think it's very important to all, like, so sample complexity and the ability to do research on a small scale, I think is, is, is also important. We do, we do a lot of kinds of research at, at DeepMind. Like there's a, there's a lot of people who uh, care a lot about the foundations and, and, and sort of testing hypotheses in a, in a, like a, in a, a, a an environment that's kind of easier to uh, test hypotheses in. Um, you know, I think of uh, things like the, uh, you know, the AI safety grid worlds is like a, something that we open. I, th I, you know, those kind of packages I think are really important uh, to look at the, um, like the foundations. And I don't think, uh, I, th I think I'll use an example. There's a paper that we, um, um, there's a collaboration between Brain and, and DeepMind mm -hmm. on uh, a, uh, proposing a challenge for a game called Hanabi. Okay. Um, and I think, uh, so in that paper, um, we, we talked about these different uh, training regimes. And, uh, you know, there's the unlimited, we call it the unlimited data regime, which is, you know, you can interact with the environment as, as much as you want. And then you report your results, um, you know, based on uh, the achievement, uh, the, you know, the number of points it was able to collaborate and, with other players and, and, and learn. Um, at the end of you know how many frames you got, but then we also said, okay, um, let's think about uh, another setting where you have a data limited regime, right? Where now you have a limit on the number of uh, on the yeah the number of episodes um, that you can uh, that you can use for compu uh, compute because those are two questions. Those are really uh, two different questions, and I think uh, answering those two questions, like tackling both of those, I think is mm -hmm. is important. Like, um, you know, it has to be, um, I think, so, so my opinion on this is I think if you, if things are reported clearly, um, 
then we avoid the kind of problems of make, of like comparing apples to oranges. And that we have to be very careful with that in the way that we yeah. disseminate our research. And I think if we get that right, then it's perfectly fine uh, to have these two regimes and then talk about them and compare results um, in the proper way. Got it. Uh, so you mentioned, and I think many people miss out on this, but DeepMind is also working on many amazing broad domains. AlphaGo Zero is what gets the, most of the spotlight. Could you yeah. maybe talk about a few that you're excited about, maybe not as excited about the uh, results from earlier, but some things or some upcoming research or current even that you're excited about? Yeah, so uh, I mentioned that I was uh, on the multi-agent team before. Like any, anything multi-agent, I think is really, really, um, ca- it really gets me excited. Um, so you know, the, uh, when I think of artificial general intelligence, I can't really separate it from, uh, you know, uh, the fact that like uh, from the multi-agent problem that uh, would be present if you put you know many of these uh, agents together uh, in a single you know in a single room, and now they have to interact and you know. Do they have to think about each other? Um, do they have to take into account how the rest of them are going to act? Yeah, these things, these are very important problems that we, you know, should have answers for or should have, uh, you know, should anticipate. So, uh, you know, when we looked at, for example, capture the flag, I think that was one that that project is really cool because um, it gets it gets out of my com- comfort zone in two ways. Um, it's it's a very rich visual environment. Right. right, and it's a three D environment where you're acting. So that already that's that's very hard. Yep. Um, but the other thing is, it's it's not just a competitive environment; it's a cooperative one as well, right? Like you're acting with other team members, yep. um, and you're trying to coordinate. So there's two in, there's two multi agent problems there. There's the cooperative one, and then there's the competitive one. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think well, I mean what I like about Capture the Flag is that the, uh, you know you can watch these videos at the end, and you could you know you can attribute agency to these things and say, wow, they are cooperating, right? And yep. they played against humans. They cooperated with humans like that. You know, the uh, playing against or with your AIs, um, you know, brings a whole new level of excitement, right, to that. And uh, I think, I think, and one of the things I think that was quite nice about uh, that research too was it was kind of trying to understand what the a- AI was thinking, right? Um, you know, when it saw the flag, they said, yeah. oh, wow, these set of neurons fired. Um, you know, these are the flag neurons. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> th- you know, that kind of research, I think, is important to understand, like, what our models are learning. Um, yep. That's one example. I, I brought up Hanabi earlier. Um, Hanabi is a really interesting game. Um, mm-hmm. It's a cooperative game, so I have, like, less experience with that. Okay. Um, but it's a really, really um, a unique game because it's a, it's a cooperative card game where um, – you're trying to put down cards in a certain order to achieve a certain number of points. And you're quite restricted on what you can say about uh, your, you're, you're not allowed to communicate freely. Um, the only way that you can communicate with your partners, it's a cooperative game. So you're trying to, you know, achieve the same goal, uh, yeah. but it's imperfect information, right? So you don't see your own cards. You, 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 you play with your cards and it's facing the other player. Your, your cards are facing the other players. Mm-hmm. So you can only determine what your cards are based on the hints that other, other players have given you. Okay. And what really makes it interesting to me is you have uh, all players in these positions all making inferences about the intentionality of, of their actions, right? So if I say, you know, the, the hints take the form, okay, you have, um, you know, uh, a one here, a one here, and a one over here, or you have uh, a green card and a blue card, uh, a green card here, here, and here. Okay. Um, and through those set of hints, uh, you not only have to determine um, what cards you are, what cards you have, and what you can put them down, you kind of have to reason through um, why certain uh, agents decided to tell you these hints over other hints. Right. And because that gives you more information. Um, and so it's a very unique game that way. And playing, playing well at Hanabi um, uh, requires you to um, think about, you know, how other uh, agents are making their decisions. So I think that's a very unique domain as well. Um, I like, I really like, uh, like I mentioned, the, the safety work. I think that's really important. Yep. Um, and the adversarial examples, uh, sorry, the, uh, yeah, the, that, but also the, um, the adversarial training, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so as we learn models, um, we're learning mappings of observations to either actions or observations to classifications, right? Yep. Um, 
And now, okay, when we poke at these observations, we, we sprinkle a few, you know, nasty pixels, right? Yeah. And suddenly, oh, it thinks it's a banana or something. Um, <laughs> you know, that, I think that's really cool, right? Because the more that we, the more that we're putting effort into these machine learning techniques, um, uh, the more they're going to be used in practice and the more important, like the, it becomes more and more important to make sure these are robust to the kind of, you know, like, you know, tampering that, that people will, will do. And it could, it's important, I think, to make sure you account for that and keep that. I think it could turn into a literal attack in the sense that if a self-driving car is driving across the road and someone Absolutely, uses yeah. those pixelated uh, attacks or yeah. another research paper that talked about how do you generate uh, toxic comments from BERT and similar models by, again, adversarial attacks. So I imagine a chatbot, a service chatbot, which faces an attack and starts giving out aggressive comments is, again, a possibility. Yeah, it... it yeah, it's 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 scary to think about you know the kind of things that this these technolog technologies would be used for, and I think understanding um, the foundations and how things like this could happen as a result of how we're mixing these algorithms together and kind of training with them yeah. um, is an important thing to keep in mind when these are getting deployed more and more. Definitely. Um, yeah. Uh, talking about one thing that's pretty common nowadays is MOOC education. So David Silver has this amazing reinforcement learning course as well. Uh, what advice do would you have for someone who's seeking a path as a researcher, but is only MOOC educated? Also, do you think uh, being having worked with David Silver is his knowledge uh, in real life as rich as uh, the MOOC or uh, MOOCs maybe not uh, might not be the best resource? No, and we have uh, we have uh, people also at. at uh... Uh, University of Alberta, who who just recently gave uh, reinforcement learning uh, MOOC as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, MOOC, it, I think MOOCs are great. Um, I th it's really great that we're um, like uh, teaching people through uh, you know entirely free or close to free um, you know resources um, like like uh, like MOOC, so that um, a lot of these concepts and ideas become sort of like accessible to everyone. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I really think that's good. And I mean that I'm coming back to OpenSpiel again, but, uh, you know, open sourcing and is a lot of the same flavor. So I became interested in, in, uh, Linux and open source. Um, and I thought, wow, this, as soon as I understood what open source was, um, to me, that was just, to me, it's just naturally the way forward. In fact, <laughs> when I was learning computer programming, uh, somebody was teaching me C and they told me, um, you know, uh, you know, you never show your source code to anybody or, or it's, it's sort of accepted like the, the, uh, you know, your, ex, uh, your source code is kind of like private. Um, uh, and this was like early nineties when, you know, uh, software was being developed and sold and, 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 you know, open source was not really a thing. Right. And yeah. my first reaction was really like, why, why would you do that? <laughs> because that would prevent sharing of like progress really. Um, like the first thing I wanted to do when I was, you know, uh, 12 or 13 was, you know, write a piece of code, log into a BBS because, you know, the, the internet was still like around <laughs> the corner <laughs> and, and upload it. Uh, and, and hopefully somebody would download it and say, Oh, I used your program. It's really cool. And like, I added this thing to it. Um, and you know, I've, I couldn't really relate to the, what they were telling me. Um, so I think MOOCs are kind of like the, the, the research and, and the, the, the teaching equivalent of that, right? It's just like, yeah. well, now we're going to take all of our expertise. We're going to teach it to like basically everybody. Um, and, and we're going to, we're just going to make it all open. And I just think this is strictly positive. Any just, advice? I'm really happy to see it. So, sorry to interrupt you. Any advice that you have for a person who's an aspiring researcher, but taking MOOC MOOC education, so what things should they keep in mind while going through that process? Uh, yeah, so I would say uh, become involved, get, get surrounded by, uh, you know, uh, uh, people who have similar interests, um, you know, write on forums. Like I, 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 I read a lot of stuff on Reddit, um, go on Twitter, like, uh, you know, all these things are free. Um, yeah. Just, but the, the more you talk and, and ask questions, the more you communicate with the, uh, with people about your, your interests and kind of pursue the, um, 
like the, you know, once you've taken a course in a MOOC, um, you can go out there and just post questions and, and get feedback. Um, one thing I like to encourage is, you know, workshop. I mean, you should, so you should go to the, you know, if you can, um, go to a lot of the conferences and actually just, just talk to like as many researchers as you can. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I like to encourage workshops because I feel like workshops are really a nice way uh, for people starting to get into the field to ask, you know, kind of, uh, you know, the, 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 it, it's a, it's a place where, um, you know, constructive feedback is, is highly encouraged. Um, yeah. And it's, it's a way uh, to get some of your ideas out in the open um, and get real feedback from, uh, you know, on a particular topic and you can meet other people. Um, so I think, you know, networking, ne networking is, is, is an important way to um, learn all kinds of things um, from, from the community. Yeah. Um, and the conferences and the workshops are just a, a great place to do that. I'd also like to also giving a plug about a community that I'm active in, but all of these courses also have now these amazing Slack communities, also the fast AI forums, for example. Right. And in India, we, I'm active in a community called Data Science Network. For the listeners, please go to dsnet.org if you'd like to join. Uh, cool. But these are also places where beginners are welcome. And these would be the ideal places because everyone is also starting to learn, not in terms of research maybe, but broadly speaking in terms of machine learning. Right. And I would, I would echo something I saw in one of your other podcasts. I think there was a... Uh, an answer like don't be afraid to ask questions um <laughs> that that's very important um and i see i see a lot of questions on um on the on the on on reddit r reinforcement learning and r machine learning and they're very basic questions and i there's nothing you know there don't be shy uh i love answering those questions um because you know i was there once and i just you know the you know things like the difference between on policy and off policy it took me a surprising amount of time to understand why the, the, that subtlety, it felt very subtle at the time when I was learning yeah. it. And, you know, I finally have a good understanding of it. And I, uh, you know, this question came up and, and I was able to communicate on a Reddit thread. I said, look, this is why. Um, here's, uh, and I think actually it wasn't quite off on policy versus off policy, but something like uh, the bias variance trade-off when you do bootstrapping versus just doing Monte Carlo. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it took me a while to get that right. And I could explain, I felt like I could explain it in a way that was understandable, even to somebody who didn't have like that much experience. And that, that was just fun. Like, I just actually just liked doing that. So <laughs> don't be, so please like, don't, yeah, don't be afraid to ask questions. Go join all the free sources, uh, resources that we have available and, and, and ask questions and you know, you might get people who are really want to answer them. To cite another example, a simple question is why does batch norm work also created this chain of research that has been still going on for all this time? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> there are going to be some very important questions that take some time to answer properly <laughs> <laughs> and lead to big research paths. <laughs> yeah, in sure. fact, we've gotten a few of those in, in OpenSpiel as well. Uh, you know, there was a few, there's... Um, somebody who's looking into an, an adapter for a general game system. Okay. And we're, you know, we're, we're going back and forth and communicating and there's a few questions I just completely didn't anticipate. And, it, and I thought to myself, Hmm, that's actually a bit of a research problem. So, you know, that, that's great. Uh, so this, this was great advice. I uh, also like to ask you one last question for beginners, broadly speaking, what best advice do you have for anyone who's starting out? in machine learning or deep learning, broadly speaking, uh, what, how should they get started and any best advice do you ha that you'd have for them? Yeah, go. Uh, so I would say a combination of two things. Um, go um, look at all the open code that is being put up there and play with it and, and, and be active about asking, don't, don't be scared to ask questions. Um, you know, if, if there's something you don't understand, um, you know, put an issue on the GitHub or contact the author by email. That's the first thing. The second thing is I would say, you know, read a lot of papers. Now, you know, that's an easy thing to say and kind of obvious, but um, a lot of, you know, a lot of the knowledge and ideas actually are going to come from reading, reading the papers um, and interacting with, with those authors. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, my experience has been, and I mean, this is true for DeepMind and, and, and every other place that I can think of. Um, people are quite receptive to answering questions about their research. Um, I really like when people contact me and say, oh, there's something I don't understand about this. Um, can you explain it? Like, I, yeah, sure. Like, I'll definitely explain that. I really like doing that. Uh, my experience has been that that's the case for most people, most researchers. Um, so, yeah, I mean, don't stop at reading the paper. If there's something you don't understand, um, write it on a forum. And if you don't quite get an understanding from that, um, contact the authors or, yeah. Um, that's amazing advice. <laughs> <laughs> So before we end the call, what would be the best platforms to follow you and follow your work? Uh, probably. Um, so I maintain two things. I mean, I think Twitter is probably the, the best. Okay. Um, at Sharky6000 is my, uh, is my handle there. Um, my website is probably the next one um, that Got I keep writing. So mlangto.info. We'll have the links in the description as well for those who'd like to check it out. Uh, again, thank you so much, Mark, for joining me and yeah. doing this amazing interview. And thank you for all your research contributions to the community. Cool. Thank, no, thanks a lot for having me. It was really fun. Likewise. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give it a review or feel free to shoot me a message. You can find all of the social media links in the description. If you like the show, please subscribe and tune in each week to Chai Time Data Science.